Many vulnerabilities are inadvertently designed into hardware and software. In addition, misconfiguration opens gaps even if a system is properly architected. In this lesson, we look at managing vulnerabilities. We also walk through steps to harden systems. Hardening is the process of configuring a system to its smallest attack surface. You can download the script for this video by clicking on the card above or at the end of the video. Vulnerabilities should be discovered and managed by an organization and its vendors before attackers discover them. This is done by inspection and testing. Teams can expect, inspect potential targets either manually or automatically. In both cases, systems are analyzed looking for known weaknesses in design, coding, and configuration. Testing is done in one of three ways, white box, black box, or gray box. White box testing is done on systems where the design and configuration is well known to the testing team. A black box test is performed on a system where the team has no knowledge of the assessed system's design and configuration. A hybrid approach is known as a gray box test. Software development assessment begins with manual reviews of each module. There are often two reviews, one by a member of the same development team and one by a developer not involved in the development of the module. As a long-time developer, I understand the importance of having another set of eyes belonging to someone without a sense of ownership of the code to review it. Code should also be tested during execution to ensure that all security requirement objectives are working properly. Misconfiguration and other types of vulnerabilities are often found during automated vulnerability scans. Solutions like Nessus look for known configurations and architecture vulnerabilities. They continuously update their known vulnerability signatures. Addressing known configuration vulnerabilities involves reducing the attack surface. An attack surface is the aggregation of opportunities for a threat actor to compromise a system. Once the vulnerabilities are identified, the security team must manage them. Managing vulnerabilities does not always mean patching or otherwise fixing them. Instead, we determine the risk associated with each vulnerability and decide how to manage that risk. Mitigation activities are prioritized based on the risk assessed. One of the tools we use for this is the CAVSS calculator. For a detailed look at how to assess vulnerability risk, watch the video above. Now let's look at some ways to avoid or correct specific vulnerabilities. Let's start with client-server communication vulnerabilities. In this example, the client is a user laptop. It can be on-premise or connecting via the cloud. The first step is to establish a secure connection. This begins by using a certificate to verify the identity of the server. In many cases, the client must also authenticate to the server. This helps manage vulnerabilities associated with redirection and other types of attacks where malicious servers masquerade as valid sites. Eavesdropping threats are common when the connection passes outside the network perimeter. It can also be a threat when a threat actor compromises one or more endpoint devices. We can mitigate this risk by encrypting connections. In this example, a session key is created using the server's public-private key pair. The session key is used to symmetrically encrypt all data over the connection. If the client assumes all data and applications coming from the server are uninfected, it creates a vulnerability that enables the spread of malware. Input validation helps check data and anti-malware can detect and block malicious executables. host space firewalls block unknown egress traffic. In addition, Digital signing of files helps detect any unauthorized changes. Threat actors getting access to a client can see any unencrypted data. Temporary and print files are often stored on the client's local storage and are accessible by anyone with access to the device. Full disk encryption can help, but preventing local storage of sensitive information is a better safeguard. Browsers should be hardened according to vendor recommendations and best practices. Patch management is also needed to eliminate known vulnerabilities. 
Hardening servers begins with following best practices, like those found in security frameworks. A good start for managing both server and client vulnerabilities is implementation of the CIS 18 critical controls. You can download the controls document from the link shown. Common server hardening steps reduce server attack services, including patching, removing or locking default accounts, changing default passwords, enabling logging and auditing to detect threat actors, considering implementation of only one primary function per server. This minimizes a server's attack surface because all other software and drivers can be removed or disabled, and removing or disabling browsers. In addition, servers should run anti-malware, firewall, and possibly host-based IDS. Finally, all unused ports and services should be disabled. Database system attack surface reduction is similar to basic server hardening. It begins by installing only what is needed to perform the database operations. Access to database services should use a unique, named, and unprivileged account. The server should not maintain command history, and the passing of credentials should not be done in the open, in plain text. Each account accessing the database should be unique, and no use of shared accounts should be allowed. TLS or IPsec should encrypt all connections to the database server. Default accounts should be disabled or their default passwords changed. As with all systems, least privilege is important. Accounts should only have the permissions and privilege level needed for daily operation. Detection of threat actions needs effective logging. Finally, all input should be validated to prevent injection attacks. Database servers should be segregated from other traffic. In this example, the organization uses VLANs to do this. The only VLAN segment that can access the database servers is VLAN 40. This enables access by application servers only. Traffic on other VLANs is blocked. Only database administrators should have direct access to databases. All other users and servers should use an application for access. For example, a user needing access to database data opens an application on the application server. He requests data for a customer. The application, which is authenticated to the database, retrieves the data and sends it to the user. The user is blocked from direct access to the database. One of the ways to substantially reduce a database attack surface is via encryption. There are five ways to encrypt the database system and related data. The first is full disk encryption. With this approach, everything stored on the server's encrypted drives is secured behind a key. The second is file system encryption. File system encryption is more selective. It enables encryption at the partition, directory, or file level. This often requires close awareness and management of all information, including temporary files that are stored on the server. Transparent data encryption, or TDE, can block database access from those who log in with administrative or root permissions if they do not have database permissions. This is a niche control and should not be used alone. CLE, or Common Cell Level Encryption, enables granular control over what is protected in each file. This approach is highly flexible, but it's often difficult to manage. CLE can also adversely affect database performance. Application Level Encryption protects the data even if the database system is compromised. This is because encryption is the responsibility of application layer software that access the data before it's passed to the database system. Encryption and decryption should be done as close to the point of use as possible. This can become more complex, but it's pretty secure. When deciding when to use encryption, an organization might need two or more approaches depending on the vulnerabilities found in the attack surfaces. This can affect database performance. 
Also, backups are protected when using TDE or CLE, but FDE does not necessarily continue on the backup media. When using FDE, backup media must be set up for its own encryption. Well, that's it for this lesson. If you have questions, please ask. And until next time, be careful what you click.